I'm going to let you pronounce your last okay, name. Okay. The last name is Buxbaum. It doesn't sound like an Irish name, but I'm 25% Irish. And we're going to talk a little bit about why that matters in one of our pairings tonight. Uh, and the, the last name, Buxbaum, it's actually a Hungarian name. Um, Ooh, okay. Um, and the company is Austin Craft Spirits, but we're mainly known by, because we're, we've got this one product, Austin 101. If you, if you notice that I am moving the bottle the wrong way for your viewers, I should warn them. This is, it's not like I'm looking in a mirror. Everything is backwards. Uh, and <laughs> it, it, it is a little confusing to the eyeballs. That's all right. We'll make do, and it probably okay. you know, maybe it'll get better as we keep drinking. I think it will. Yeah, <laughs> most things are better with some whiskey in the belly. They sure are. All right, Tom. Well, why don't we kick it off? Let's. Uh, so, what do we do first? Are we going to pour? You I say the very first thing we do before I tell you any of our history or anything is put some Austin One One in your glass. And Absolutely. the reason why I do that before we sniff it or taste it is to to let the the spirit uh, open. It, it has a, a bouquet, uh, a fragrance that uh, opens the way wine does in a glass given a few moments. And um, so we're going to talk about it for, for uh, those, those minutes while it's opening. Uh, History Austin Craft Spirits Company. Um, I'll, if you don't mind, I'll just kind of riff for, for a bit, and then you can start asking questions. Austin Craft Spirits Company, we started about three years ago. We got all our licenses in place a little over two years ago. Um, we had one first project, which was an Eau de Vie, which is a, a brandy that is perfectly clear. It's not oaked. It's uh, the, the essence of the flavor of the fruit. It tends to be a very high proof, and it's a European thing. It, uh, it's found all over Central Europe, and in France they call it Eau de Vie, which means water life. And this is our first project because we thought that Fredericksburg peaches, Hill Country peaches, were really special, and that they don't travel well. No, no one else in the country except the people that live in Central Texas know how these are the peaches of our youth and how sweet and juicy and remarkable they are, and they don't travel. So the peaches that do travel are the ones that are picked in Imperial Valley or wherever in California. And they're a little bit green and they put them in a truck and they last all the way to the East Coast. Um, anyway, we wanted to see if we could capture the flavor of these Frederick peaches in the form of a European style out of E. And we did. That was our first project. Uh, cool. Fredericksburg peach out of E. It's not on any shelf. Uh, we did it for fun. Uh, you have to be a friend of Tom Buxbaum, one of the founders, to get a bottle. Uh, it's, um, I mean, we decided not to commercialize it because pe peaches are very expensive. Uh, right. It's very seasonal. In some seasons, there aren't any. But we learned so much about how to extract the flavor of an agricultural product and, and present it in a really, really clean way. And we didn't want to pay $2 a pound. Grains are much more, I mean, by the time that you make a bottle of with 20 pounds of peaches, you've got a product that's pretty well priced itself off of the shelf. Right. Um, but whiskey is made with, with grains that cost, you know, 10 cents a pound to a dollar a pound, depending on the grain. Um, and um, you can make something that's, that's much more approachable financially. With what we learned about how to extract the flavor of an agricultural product, we thought we would do a, pro, a, a some projects around Texas grains and the flavors that can be extracted from local, very, very local, very fresh agricultural grains okay. and uh, do it in a way that was very different than a bourbon. We wanted something that was a, uh, a symphony of the grains and wasn't smothered by the barrel. So typically, uh, you, you, you've probably tasted as many or more bourbons than I have, even though I look a little grayer around the edge than you do. Uh, typically, bourbons are very, very heavily influenced by the oak. Okay. In order to make an American style whiskey, which tastes like bourbon or is bourbon, you really, you have to use, in order to make bourbon legally and call it bourbon, you have to use a, a new 
oak barrel. It's never been used for anything else. And it has to be heavily charred. Doesn't have to be a number three char, but it has to be charred. It's covered with charcoal all the way on, around on the inside. And the whiskey has to be put in that barrel. And it gets a flavor. And I, I, you, you may be able to, 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 to disagree with me on this, but I think that, that an American rye and an American bourbon that have been barreled the same way, but made from completely different grains, actually taste 70% the same. There's a difference, but there's more similarity than difference. So people tell me that they think that whiskey, bourbon, right. the flavor is two thirds or three quarters from the barreling and only one third or one quarter from the grains that were used. We wanted to turn that upside down. So we wanted to make a product that was two thirds the flavor of the grains and one third from the finishing in the barrels that we select. So with that objective in mind, uh, we had to use a much lighter product. We had to use a distillate that didn't need years in a barrel. And I can talk to you a little bit later about why a light whiskey doesn't need to be barreled the same way and aged the same manner in which a bourbon does. And um, we end up with something very different. So I'm gonna warn you again, it's 101 proof. So when you or any of your listeners sniff this, I, I don't put your nose in it the way you do a, a, a wine and um, well, I learned that trick at the Jameson distilleries. You, you oh, know, good. Mouth open, so allowing some air to flow through, right? So you don't burn your mouth. Mm -hmm. But yeah. Wow. And you should be getting a very non bourbon experience. You should be getting butterscotch, vanilla, a yeah. fruitiness. A lot creamier than a typical bourbon. Cream. I mean, a will burn, you know. I don't really get a lot of burn on this at all. No, and at uh, 101 proof, it's. People tell us how it's unbelievably approachable for Absolutely. Uh, for an overproof spirit. And when you look at it, so after you've, now that you've nosed it, look at it, you'll see this doesn't look anything like bourbon. Bourbon is red and brown and dark. Yeah. This is golden. Which is mostly looks, character, like you said, get you get from the barrel. I mean, that's a lot of that. Exactly. Because we both go into the barrel we look like vodka. It's absolutely clear, like gin clear. And when it goes into the barrel and when it comes out, we go for this flavor. And I'll explain to you how we, how we uh, finish it in barrels. Okay. Uh, but now I, before you taste it, I'm going to give you another little tip on tasting Austin 101. Because it's 101 proof, it can be a shock to your palate. So okay. I recommend three sips. The first sip being essentially wet your palate, wet your lips, just barely um, get exposed them to the proof. And then a small sip to really warm up your entire palate. Okay. Because once you're ready for it, that third sip, you I want to ask you, what does it feel like in your mouth? What is the mouth feel of this? And how is it different than bourbon? Because I think you'll see that it's remarkable. Okay, so let's wet it first. And then a little bit. Out of the way. <laughs> oh, wow. And now see what it feels like on your palate, now that your mouth is ready. Definitely comes in a lot, not, it's still pretty strong, but it, you know, it abates a lot of that burn. And, and, and do you notice the roundness, the little bit of a slipperiness of the, yeah. uh, Butteriness almost. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. I've had people tell me, I don't like this term. I bet I have people tell me that it feels kind of oily in your tongue. Yeah. It, it lasts and it, it, yet, oh, yeah. um, it's velvety. Yeah. And now, now that you've swallowed it, you're going to start to get another set of sensations that comes from that finish. It leaves almost a tingle. <laughs> I don't know if that's normal, but yeah. 
and the 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 aromas, the the butterscotch, the vanilla, the uh, the sweetness. Do you catch the sweetness? Oh, absolutely. You get that right off the bat with the butterscotch. Honestly, I don't know. So I'm assuming you've had TX whiskey, right? I have. I I'm not sharing a bunch of others, but but TX whiskey with the, with the creamy, the buttery flavor, that's almost what it reminds me of. Granted, that's a darker, probably a little more imposed from the barrel, but, um, but a very different overall mouthfeel on this than that. That's more light and it almost feels carbonated for a whiskey, but this is you know a little more dense. It feels a little more heavy in the mouth. Um, and then, like you said, that kind of lasting finish, that that slipperiness almost. Like I just took a mouthful of butter, but but very <laughs> sweet tasting butter. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I've had people uh, tell me that that uh, very similar to that, and and um, so I'm going to tell you something about the Austin 101 that most of the time when you buy something that's called whiskey, and not bourbon, they can't right. say this. Whiskey is allowed to have adulterants, and it's not uncommon that if it's called whiskey and not bourbon, that it has sugar or caramel or butterscotch flavors, caramel more likely, but sugar is also not uncommon. And in some cases, even here in Texas, there's some vanilla. Huh. Not with the, with, if it says bourbon on it, they've got to follow some federal rules. And if it says bourbon, uh, as opposed to whiskey, it can have no adulterants, nothing but the grains, the water, the barrels. Okay. And we follow those rules. We don't you we don't barrel it the same way and we don't distill it the same way. And I'll talk to you about why that's different and in what way it's different. But even though we're we're whiskey and not bourbon, we don't do what a lot of whiskey makers do. We were advised you ought to put some caramel color in this because it doesn't look like whiskey. And you know, it looks like what it is. It is light, it tastes light, it smells light. It makes a lighter cocktail than a dark, chewy whiskey does. Uh, it's light, so yeah. let it look light. And um, so we add absolutely nothing. There's three grains in here, and I'll tell you what they all are. Okay. Uh, there's used bourbon barrels, and there's local water. Um, reverse osmosis, double filtered, extra purified uh, Hill Country water. And it... Um, it couldn't be more authentic and it couldn't be more local. So the grains, do you want me to go through all of that story now? Yeah, or do you want to jump in? I, I, I want to hear it all. But uh, before we jump into that, I was curious, have you does, I know a lot of times with mo most whiskeys, at least in my experience, uh, just a drop of water will open up a little more flavor, a little more aromatics. Does that happen with this whiskey or have you experienced that in the past? I was just told today by, by a good friend of mine that does that with his scotch all the time, I, I really need to do that. I, I haven't. I mean, I've had it with water, and it tastes good. Okay. Uh, but I've never done the thing you do with scotch where you add an eyedropper full of water. I don't have an eyedropper, so I'm just going to eyeball it. I'm going to give it a try. Worst comes to worst, it doesn't work. I sip this down, and then I pour some more. There you go. <laughs> so I'm, I am, I'm used to drinking cognac after dinner. I mean, that was my, I, I drink neat. And, uh, if it's less than 90 proof, it, it tastes a little bit weak to me. So, uh, how is it with water? Not a huge bit of difference, although it might've been because I hadn't had any in my mouth for the past couple of minutes while I was talking to you that it just felt more full and more round again, but you know, it could very well be. <laughs> when when we when we first made our decisions on bottling this, we we took it to a number of people, mm -hmm. and we had it tasted at eighty proof, a hundred proof, and a hundred and fifteen proof. Wow! Uh, and uh, hundred proof was by far the favored by the people that tasted it. So eighty proof might be just a little too. Um, well, I was going to say 80 proof would be what you'd be expecting to get with it, right? You know, you're looking right. at it and you think it's light. It's going to be light or, or you know, around that very minimal amount that you see typically. I mean, 80 proof is kind of the baseline, you know, most whiskeys, most bourbons. Right. <clears throat> before you start overproofing it, you know. Anyway, uh, we, we have taken this to a number of uh, venues where we've had a large number of people taste it. 
Um, okay. First one of those was just about two years ago. We went to something called the East Austin Urban Farm Tour. Okay. And the only, there were, uh, I don't know, there were 500 people that came and spent 75 bucks or something to taste really, really local products. Our table was right next to Dripping Springs Vodka and uh, Uchi's, um, okay. uh, the, the, the uh, uh, really high-end um, uh, sushi uh, place in, uh, in South Austin. And we were highly encouraged to take the product to market. But the thing that was most encouraging is we kept hearing from people that the product is approachable. And this was at 101 proof. They said, you know, I don't normally drink whiskey, many of them, Most but I'd, I'd drink this. And um, that how it really didn't come across like 100 proof. So we yeah. were encouraged after that to, that 100, 100 proof was the right. And 101, it looks cool on the bottle. It sounds better. I have to admit, I wouldn't be able to tell you the difference if it was a 100 proof versus 101. But the, the logo is very distinctive. And I'll quiz you later on what you think that local looks like when it reaches the back of your brain. Um, but people see different things, and it, it it but it is something that stands out on on the back bar. Gotcha. Okay. So let me tell you about the grains, if that's all right. Yeah, yeah let's get back to that. So the general discussion is they're all Texas grains. That was our objective, and we wanted to stay with local. Yeah. Uh, I've got samples of the grains right here behind me. They're um, uh, uh, non-GMO Texas white corn, which uh, is what is really creates the sweetness in this. Uh, there's a, uh, um, a malt that is made from Texas grown barley that is malted in Fort Worth. Okay. It's, called, uh, it's called wildfire. And it is a little bit higher toasted than a normal malt. So if you catch a little bit of a of a a toasty flavor, like this is not just butter, but it's buttered um, toast or English muffin. The toastiness and the nuttiness comes from this this um, wildfire uh, uh, malt, and then the third grain is uh, a Texas hard red wheat it's a winter wheat from the panhandle and it makes a you know there's a handful of wheated bourbons most people when they think bourbon they think of one that the main flavor growing grain is rye right uh, the main grain 51 percent has got to be corn but of the flavor grains it's uh, 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 malted barley and uh, typically rye there's a handful that are wheated I noticed that just recently you were out in high Texas. Yeah. Uh, the Garrison yeah. Brothers, uh, their their whiskey is uh, wheated. Okay. Uh, Blanton's is wheated. Uh, right. Maker's Mark is wheated. Um, uh, Pappy's is wheated. Typically, except for um, uh, Garrison Brothers, wheated whiskeys tend to be aged for a long time before they start to get um, that mouthfeel and stuff. Right. Austin 101, this this slippery, velvety, smooth mouthfeel that you get, and the little bit of note of fruitiness is the wheat. And this, for the common man, this may be the most affordable way to find out what a weeded whiskey is supposed to be. That little bit of fruitiness and that smooth roundness that, that you taste on, on Austin 101 is what we can do with a weeded whiskey without having to put it in a big dark barrel for years, like a Pappy's, uh, and yet still express that fruitiness and um, the velvetiness. And it's not smothered then with, with dark, dark brown chewiness. Mm. So I'm gonna let you say a few things about the spirit before I go on and talk any more about how we make it. What are you? Uh, what are you I sensing? More questions about how you make it. Um, <laughs> like, like I mentioned, I, I definitely get you know mostly that creamy butterscotch forward, a little bit of nuttiness, more on the finish. I would say yeah. I don't get it much on the nose at all, and the fruitiness. I just it might be me. Um, I'm, I'm going to say I don't have a refined enough palate to pick out all of those flavors apart myself. But but it's interesting. I you know the more that you're you talk about it the more I pick up on some of those subtleties that, you know, um, my, I guess my palate wouldn't ordinarily be able to articulate. 
So it's interesting. So, so when you mentioned that um, just a second ago, you mentioned you know getting some of that more of that flavor, that nuttiness, that fruitiness, that and that mouthfeel without having to be you know barrel aged. So now are the is your Austin is the Austin one on one whiskey? Is it barrel aged at all? I, I try not to use the word aged. The, the the federal government requires me to put an age statement on the whiskey. Okay. So I put an age statement on, and the age statement says aged 101 days in recycled uh, whiskey barrels. Wow. Uh, and the the um, age statement, by federal regulations, I can exceed that. So we just don't bother looking at the barrels until the the the, the, the uh, whiskey's been in it for at least 101 days. Sometimes it's in twice as long, um, three times as long. But the, but we don't like to use the word age because unlike bourbon and other American whiskeys, it's shocking to say this, but this distillate is delicious on the day that it comes off the still. Uh, have you ever had a white dog or a new make whiskey right off the a bourbon still? I have not. That actually, um, that actually is something that I will be doing with with Don and Todd over there at Garrison Brothers in the near future as kind of a follow up to my interview with Dan Garrison. But that is something that I've been wanting to do for a while. I've had some. Um, there are some that do their their white, you know, um, whiskey alongside their like they'll bottle it and just sell it. But I haven't had it fresh off the still. Unfortunately. Okay. So you have you had like the Buffalo Trace, which they actually bottle and sell little 375s of White Dog? I haven't had Buffalo Traces, but I have had Copper Runs, which is up in uh, Branson, Missouri, um, mm -hmm. and a few others. Well, I, you know, I don't want to say anything bad about bourbon because it's the quintessential American whiskey, and I love bourbon, and I love Garrison Brothers. Um, and, and I love Still Austin. Yeah. Uh, and uh, Texas whiskeys are really good. Um, but without letting the cat out of the bag, when you taste that white dog, uh, I would not call it a beverage. It is not something you drink for pleasure. It's a, it's an experiment, right? Yeah. I mean, it's made that way on purpose. It has to taste like that. It has to have those flavors in order to have years in a barrel, turn it into something lovely. Uh, right. By, by law, a new make whiskey that you're going to make bourbon out of mm -hmm. cannot come off the, the still purer than a certain number. You, it can't be higher. And that number off the still for a bourbon is 160 proof, which is 80% alcohol. Okay. Typically, normally, and I don't know, you have to ask Garrison Brothers what they do, theirs at, but normally they don't get close to 160. 130 or 140 is very, very normal for somebody that's going to age their their bourbon for a long time in a barrel. At 130 or 140, so I'm going to describe to you what's actually going on in the still in a minute, but it, you're getting a lot of things besides alcohol, flavor, and water. You're getting right. other chemicals. And I'll describe what's going on in, the, in these pot stills, uh, and you've seen them. Yep. Uh, that add these flavors, which are not palatable. That's why it's not a beverage yet until it's been aged. Um, the, in the case of Austin 101, we're steam distilled to a, we're not allowed to use the word purity by federal law, but we're distilled to a higher purity than right. uh, a, a white dog would be. We, we, by, by law, if you're above 160 proof, Okay. Uh, and below 190 proof, you and you are a grain-based spirit, you're a light whiskey. Okay. If you get to 190, the flavor is all gone, God. and it's vodka. So vodka is distilled to 190 proof or above, and it's designed to remove all flavor. Most light whiskeys historically in America have been distilled to as close as possible to 190 to remove all of those flavors and yet still be able to call it whiskey. The vast majority of light whiskeys made in America have been used for blending in blended whiskeys or sold to Canada to be used in blended Canadians 
because it's whiskey, but it's distilled to 189 and a half. It's bad vodka. I mean, it's not whiskey. Uh, at at 160, it becomes light whiskey, but it's still funky. So I'm I'm going to try and define what word funky means in a minute. It's got these congeners in it. And somewhere between 190, I'm sorry, but from 160 up to 190, it starts to lose flavor. Gotcha. So what we've managed to do is to dial in the spot where, unlike the stuff that's getting used in blended whiskey, we've got these flavors. But unlike uh, bourbon, we don't have to sit in a barrel for a long, long time and get smothered with oak. Uh, so our flavors can come out. So this light whiskey, it's really something. It's really completely different. If you happen to like it, you're not going to find anything else on the shelf that is that is this. This is re- it's truly unique. Um, so let, these congeners I talked about, the funkiness that leads to the good flavors ultimately in bourbons, which right. become wonderful in time. Uh, you've seen these stills. Um, the vast, the large, the, a large portion of, of American whiskey is made in what are called pot stills. It's a really big enclosed pot with a tank that is filled with boiling beer. And the vapors are collected, condensed, and that becomes the white dog. Well, the reason um, that I bring this up is that in that big st- pot or kettle, the, 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 the beer that goes in that is not like the beer that you would normally drink out of a can. It's not like your Budweiser. It's, it's more like a thin porridge. It's got crushed grains in it. It's got dead yeast in it. It's got alcohol in it. And it sits in this pot and it boils for hours. I mean, we're talking about thousands of gallons of this beer, which is more like thin porridge boiling for hours with grains and dead yeast and all it just it's funky it is not something you would eat for breakfast Mm -hmm. and the spirits that come off of it carry all of those flavors right that's why white dog is not in my opinion palatable but when it's when those when all of that which include higher alcohols and esters and other chemicals and they're called congeners things other than ethanol and water Right. Uh, when those flavors get barreled for a long time, the oxygen, the oak, the chemistry, they change and it becomes lovely, but that's aging or maturing. Now I'm going to tell you what we do in order to capture these, uh, this essence of these grains steam distilled. There happens to be a still here in Austin that we have access to, which is 42 feet tall. Um, the beer is injected into the still and steam rises from the bottom. Okay. Very, very different than putting it in a kettle and boiling it for four five, six hours. The beer drops to the bottom and gets given back to the, the farmers and the steam lifts the essence, the flavors and the alcohol from the beer and lifts it up this 42 foot column still where it percolates bubbles through some baffles and ends up in the, uh, on the 12th or 14th plate. It's as if it's been distilled more than 10 times because the, the vapors are bubbling through uh, progressively purer and purer and purer uh, um, distillate. Right. And we collect it off near the top. And it, so the beer doesn't boil for hours. The beer's not in contact with the dead yeast and the grains for a long time. The steam lifts it and it's taken immediately off and the beer leaves off the bottom immediately. It's a continuous process. It's mm-hmm. called continuous distillation. It's a one of a kind still. It was handmade in Scotland and sold here to still Austin in Austin on, on St. Elmo street. You can see it. Um, and it's a wonderful still. They don't talk it up as much as I do because uh, <laughs> they're making bourbon with it. They, they, and that's just fine. Um, and they make a lovely bourbon. I, it's one of the best bourbons anywhere. And it, it's, it's here, you know, right here in Texas. And it comes off of this lovely still. It makes the cleanest possible distillate. And it enabled us to, to make this product, our, our time available on that still. 
Awesome. So that's what steam distillation means. And that's how light whiskey is different from bourbon. One other difference is how it's aged, and I'll cover that. Uh, and it's also how Austin 101 is different from other light whiskeys. It wasn't designed to be a light whiskey. It was designed to be a cognac of grains, you know, a, uh, a celebration, a symphony of, of, of Texas agriculture. And I think we did a good job of it. I was going to say, I still, I still think it is very much a ode to and a symphony of Texas flavors. And it's all right. Well, thank you. Yeah, it was a lot of time and work went into this product. And if you don't live in Austin, you or at least nearby, it's pretty hard to find. I mean, there just isn't any of this outside of Texas. So you're, hopefully your listeners get a chance to get well, it's part of the inspiration behind the channel is that, you know, my wife and I always talk about our favorite things to do when we travel is to visit those little gems that you and local flavors that you can only get in that region. So that's what this has become is, you know, it's trying to become is just sharing those, you know, just like Austin 101, those things you, if you didn't live here, you wouldn't know about, you know. Right. Yeah. Well, I was going to tell you a little something about how we're finished. I don't like to use the word aged. But we are finished in, in bourbon barrels, uh, like uh, in some ways, like the um, uh, Highland Scotches. But a Highland Scotch, they'll put it in a bourbon barrel for, for 12 years. Uh, but we, we have select bourbon barrels that, we, um, that have been used once and that we use a second, third uh, time. And um, we get to know our barrels and we've used we use the ones we love and we have really started to uh, uh, focus on Garrison brothers. A couple of things. I mean, their barrels, they, they, they've taken out everything we don't want. Uh, they taste wonderful and they give the color and flavor that we're looking for. Uh, secondly, I don't know if you know this, but Garrison brothers barrels in 25 and 30 gallon barrels. And uh, yeah. I know I look like a big, buff, strong old guy, but uh, <laughs> I don't like throwing around 50-gallon, 350-pound, 400-pound barrels of whiskey. I'd, I'd rather, uh, you know, roll around something that's half as big. Um, like you still roll them. <laughs> yeah, you roll them, you tip them over, but it's a lot harder to tip a 50-gallon barrel than it is a 30-gallon or 25-gallon. That's fair, especially a full one. <laughs> so we... We finish in those. We taste those barrels after they've been uh, aging for 100 days or so, uh, 101 days or more, and uh, we select them and send them off to be uh, bottled when they're just right, when they taste like this. So what I'm going to do now is answer any questions you have, and I'm about to open my Guinness. Okay. Well, I'll be right there with you. So what kinds of questions have I brought to mind with my long words? I was going to say you've answered most of the ones that I've had going into it. Um, so, I mean, with and and we can talk a little bit more about um, some aspects that you haven't covered, like, you know, the fact that the distiller, you, you have a distillery, you have a facility, but not really a facility that is open to the public, right? Like not a, a um, I don't, I keep forgetting what the word is for like a tap room, but for a distillery. We don't, we don't have a tasting room. Yeah, there we go. Uh, I can talk about that, and I can talk about the fact that you know we, we've got barrels. <laughs> there, there's not a lot to look at. We've got we've got but barrels and a little bit of pumping equipment. Where where the Austin 101 is available, though, you know, uh, um, some liquor stores, but also quite a few bars and restaurants. Um, we're, we're, how did you decide on those? Well, uh, the very first thing we did before um, we we took the product out is you have to have a distributor. Mm -hmm. And we we really wanted uh, R and D C. They're the second biggest distributor in America. We've heard nice things from Austin retailers, uh, the, the liquor stores, about the R and D C people. They okay. seem to have the most feet on the street here in in Austin. Yeah, and because of their strength locally, really great people, and they're huge. I mean, it's a multi billion dollar company. I can't sell, uh, other than in a tasting room, I can't sell whiskey except to a distributor. So we okay. needed R&DC. We, we recruited them and we are distributed by them. Uh, we, I told you two years ago, we brought the product to East Austin Urban Farm Tours and we were 
so encouraged by the the public uh, to get it on the shelf. I mean, we he had. Uh, 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 over, I mean, there were a total of about 300 people or 400 people that, that walked by our booth. It was in three different farms. And uh, we ended up getting more than 105 people left, 105, 106 people left cell phone numbers, email addresses to say, when you're on the shelf, let me know where it is. And <laughs> it, it was just overwhelmingly positive. That's so awesome. anyway, we were encouraged. We, we hired a local artist to do this bottle. We had a couple of different looks. We had a, a little bit more of a, of a retro look and we decided to go with something that was really clean and angular and, yeah. and very, it really stand out as other than the whiskeys and bourbons on the American or uh, bourbon aisle. And it, I think it does stand out well. Absolutely. Um, the squareness of it. And we're, we're probably in 35 or 40 uh, liquor stores total. Okay. Uh, and we're the San Antonio, Dallas, uh, Austin, and a few small towns. Uh, and they're other than four stores, they're all pretty small. That we're in four specs. Yep. And that was because the local Austin management of specs was. I really wanted to carry a local product, and it, so we don't really have a relationship with Houston to speak of. But with with these four specs, we're doing tastings there regularly, and we're doing real well. Awesome. Um, and we're, we introduced, we really introduced the product after we got RNDC on board, put it, put it in the warehouse. We got it into a couple of stores and we went to the Texas whiskey festival. That was a year ago, uh, this week. I mean, I think it was the 7th of March. And I don't know if you remember a year ago, the 11th was the day they shut the country down. Right. I mean, there was a basketball game going that day and they told everybody to go home. The <laughs> pandemic was declared, but on, on the 7th of March, the country was still open. There were over a thousand people came to the Texas whiskey festival and, uh, you pay your 50 bucks or 75 bucks. Do you get a chance to taste a lot of Texas whiskeys? A lot of them. You should go, by the way, it's coming up again in April. Got my eye on it. What I need to do is get a few people that can share a table. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it'll be great. Um, well, I hope to see you there. Absolutely. We, we'll, we'll be there. And uh, so we were there last year. There's over a thousand people. Nobody knew what a mask was yet. Mm -hmm. uh, and the, the, everyone that came had a chance to taste of 61 different whiskeys from 25 different distillers here in Texas. What a great way to spend an evening in a beautiful venue out outdoors uh, in a, in west of the city. And so we'd have people stopping by uh, all night long. And they had two jobs. One was to figure out how to get home safely. And yeah. the other job was to pick the best whiskey in Texas. <clears throat> okay. Uh, oh. And they had to taste 61 different whiskeys or as many as they could uh, and, and pick the one they thought was the best whiskey. And um, feel bad for the I'm looking. Island, any, by the time you get into the 40s and 50s, I can't imagine you're tasting much anymore. <laughs> I no, I'm sure they didn't taste all of them, but I can say we got a lot of votes. We mm -hmm. we got the silver medal for People's Choice Award, which meant we got the wow. second most votes of any Texas whiskey, and we were up against every name you can think of. Oh, yeah, um, pretty big names like Garrison Brothers. I mean, yes, they were there, and uh, they've won it in the past. But this particular yeah. year, last year, we took. Silver, silver. The That's one it. that got the top choice, I forgot what it was, but it was a flavored whiskey. So I, I don't really, I, I, I don't know. I, we won. I feel like we won anyway. We got the silver buckle, and I was, we were really, really proud of that. And then four days later, everything else that was on our calendar for introducing the product was canceled. We we're supposed to go to the, wow, you know, Austin Food and Wine Food Festivals and other whiskey festivals. And they were all shut down. So. so we're going to so relaunch. Was that when you, that's when you first launched, right? You, that's what you're saying is that wow, March, so March 7th was the day our website went live. Okay. We were, we'd been in one liquor store for one week so that they could supply the, the, wow. uh, uh, the taste of uh, the, um, Texas whiskey festival. But anyway, if, if your viewers want to go to the, t just look up Texas whiskey festival, uh, 2021 yeah. they'll find out about it. it's in april there's plenty of time and there's still seats available oh yeah 
yeah, that's something that's uh, that's on our list. We just haven't made the decision if we're going to attend this year or not. But I mean, yeah, like I said, we've already had COVID, so we're <laughs> we've got our vaccine for a little bit, right? <laughs> well, my 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 it. wife and I and and uh, uh, my co-founder that'll be there and his wife, we've all been vaccinated, so we're we're post-pandemic. Um, there you go. Moving I forward. just oh my gosh, look at that. Oh yeah. So in case you're viewers aren't familiar with this product this is uh this is getting stout draft small name from some small island over the pond i don't know <laughs> this is uh a, a little bit of of nectar from from the, the emerald isle and uh i don't know if you heard how different it sounded when you pop the top there's tell you tell them about it anthony you you were at the guinness oh, warehouse yeah. more recently than i that nitro ball. Well, I don't know if you know this, but the uh, I forget what the name of the award, but the, the nitro ball that Guinness developed that is in these cans that nitrogenates the beer basically is the equivalent of the high speed um, uh, taps that Guinness has at their, their spouts at, at the Guinness brewery. And you see in many authentic Irish bars, it won an award, won the Queen's Award for one of the most innovative or the most innovative product. I forget what year, maybe, uh, I just posted about it. I can't remember what the mm -hmm. year was, but it won the Queen's Award for the most innovative invention globally, which is impressive because there's a lot of inventions. I don't know, I don't know if you guys know that, but. Yeah. I'm sure there are a lot of inventions. <laughs> so this, this, I saw that St. Patty's Day was on its way and I wanted to just see First of all, I want to see how this tasted in an Irish car bomb. Oh, and, man. Uh, but before I did, I decided I would try a shot in a beer. Only it's the opposite of a shot in a beer. I'll tell you why it's the opposite in a minute. But I take get, take a swallow and then take a sip. Oh, my goodness. It's a whole nother experience, isn't it? I feel like my taste buds are fighting themselves right now. But it's so it's so sweet. It completely so the, the for those of your of your viewers that aren't familiar with Guinness Stout, it's very very creamy. There's a little bit of bitterness to it, and like, it's very very rich flavor. Yeah, it's robust, and then the whiskey, it like almost evolves the the texture of it. It engulfs the texture of the, the swallow of Guinness, but then it adds this sweet component that just completely juxtaposes the bitterness of the Guinness. It's like nectar, right? I mean, it's it's just unbelievably sweet and so smooth and round after the Guinness. I'm never going to have a St. Patrick's Day in my life without doing this. It's like fire and ice. I, I don't know if you, you're a Game of Thrones fan, but that's all I can think of. <laughs> It's just it because the Guinness you take it's cold, it's nice, it's refreshing, and then you take this and it just warms it right up. Oh my goodness! Yeah, I'm gonna have to try an Irish car bomb, but I don't know if I'm gonna do that on camera. <laughs> my wife tried mixing them together, and it it just it was not. It lost the intensity of doing yeah. them separately. Well, so you, it, you don't have as, as much of appreciation when you're chugging an entire pint. <laughs> well, that's a good point. So the. The thing that's different about this and a shot in a beer, so the difference between this and an Irish car bomb is Irish car bomb, you'd put it in the beer you'd, yeah. or you drop your shot glass right in there. Uh, with this, uh, the, a, a boiler maker or a shot in a beer typically would be, it's uh, a, a shot of, of cheap whiskey that you'd down the shot and then you'd sip the beer to clear it, clear the bad whiskey off your palate. This is the complete opposite. This is a like one of the most wonderful brews in the world, followed by one of the most delicious and pure uh, and approachable spirits. Um, I was going to say I don't want to wash away the flavor of the whiskey. It just complements it so well. Yeah, you wouldn't. That's you wouldn't do the whiskey and then the the brew. You do the brew and then the whiskey, yeah. and your it leaves your mouth happy. Oh, it does. It absolutely does. It helps that Guinness is one of our all-time favorites. But even if Guinness wasn't an all-time favorite, I right. think you might find that this is a pretty cool 
Now I'm kind of curious. The the engineer inside of me just wants to taste test this with all different kinds of beers now. Like I'm curious how it would taste with like a lighter, especially an IPA with the hoppy bitter flavor, really bitter, intense flavor. I wonder if it would round it out really well. Because I'm not a huge IPA fan, but I don't know. It might it might be a nice combination. It might be. I mean, this is so new. You, any combination you try is likely to be breaking new ground. And if you let me know, obviously we'll get the word out. Oh, absolutely. So speaking of that, so you guys yeah. being pretty new, like at this point, just over a year in terms of release of the whiskey, have I don't even know if you've had any time to think about it, but w what are your thoughts towards expanding, trying different variations, maybe? Um, experimenting a little bit with the, you know, the formula, have, have you put any thought into that or do you have any ideas of where, you know, I can tell you, I can tell you uh, if, as long as you promise not to tell your viewers, what I think are, are, are likely brand ex band extensions would be, um, we've got a, uh, a, a, a barrel of, of rye, yeah, wow. uh, light whiskey, light whiskey, that's 70% rye. And we may try a, a light whiskey that's 100% rye. We'll, we'll, yeah, we'll see. But uh, it, uh, our hope is there's, as I said, a, a, an American rye and an American bourbon. They're 70% the same. Oh yeah. Well, I think a light whiskey made this way, and evidence so far shows that a light whiskey made this way, they're not 70% the same. They're much closer to 70% different because mm -hmm. the grains are expressed so broadly. So yeah. the, 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 it, a lot of people are going to say they prefer the, the buttery fruitiness of the yeah. Austin 101. Yeah, but there will be a handful of people that say they really like the spiciness of that Texas rye. And that, so that's a possible brand extension for us. And when we've got some samples, I'd love to get your opinion on them. Oh, well, I'll, I'll be giving it, but uh, I think my wife will want to weigh in a little bit more considering she's the rye drinker in our family. Ironically enough, she, she hated whiskey when we started dating, especially scotch, mm -hmm. but now I can't get her off of the stuff. Uh, oh, really? Rye whiskey, she likes the more intense, spicy, robust flavor, but she's also an IPA drinker, so maybe that correlates. I don't know. Well, we're going to have to convert her to Austin 101, which is, I don't think, going to be too hard. If she likes scotch, oh, yeah. um, people that like scotch and like Irish are much, That's... are really quite likely to enjoy Austin 101. Well, like I was telling you, we, we honeymooned in Ireland back in 2019 before the shit hit the fan. And mm -hmm. uh, we, I'm glad we did right away because <laughs> 2020 would have not been a good year to honeymoon. But no. um, when we did, you know, at that point, I had we had both kind of come around to developing a really, in you know, a, a preference towards Irish whiskeys. And since then, you know, in 2020 has hit. We had nothing better to do than just to taste a bunch of different whiskeys and beers and be at home and not travel. So that's you know kind of how I started the channel is I just tried a bunch of stuff, realized I want to share this. You know, I think the world needs to know about really cool whiskeys like Austin 101 and you know, other ones that you, you can't necessarily get um, when we're traveling and we experience it that other people don't know about. So try and create, create a following and create more conversations in the community around this, you know, different styles. So people that are new or people that have experienced a certain region of whiskey or region of beer uh, or even a region of wine um, or, you know, the initial ones, the eau de vie, you know, the, the really alternative spirits um, get a chance to, get a feel for other regionals, other varietals, um, and expand their palates as well. Yeah. It's true. It's a big world out there. And when you, there's certain aisles that you walk down in a liquor store, oh, yeah. there's bottle after bottle after bottle that are almost the same. And then there's other aisles you go down and you go, where's this been all my life? <laughs> I mean, it's totally, it's completely off the wall. Yeah. So, uh, Austin That's 101 right. is going to be one of those. Where have you been all my life? That's that's how I'm like starting to feel about all the Texas whiskeys I've been trying in the past year. There's some good stuff here. Oh, there's no doubt about it. There it, is no doubt about it. I I've seen some articles come out about it, and I I really truly believe it. I think Texas whiskey it's already starting to, but I think in the next few years it's really gonna blow up and become like 
it, it might give you know Kentucky bourbon a run for its money in terms of the following, in terms of the reputability, uh, the no, you know people knowing the names, the brands. Uh, it, it already is. I mean, with you know some of the big names that are coming out, like Garrison. We keep talking and coming back to Garrison Brothers. Uh, they're a big name um, right. out of Central Texas. And the Texas Whiskey Trail. I'm drinking from their glass right now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's, it's I don't know who's. Uh, my, no, this one's got no logo on it. If it did have a logo, it would either be Garrison Brothers or still Austin. My wife keeps telling me I need to get no logo Glencairn glasses, but I like I keep collecting them from different you know distilleries and and events that I go to. I like having an amalgamation, you know, mm -hmm. of different like oh I've been there. That's I'm gonna drink to this, you know, tonight. I do the same thing with pint glasses, different distilleries, but. But neither here nor there. Uh, but yeah, no, I, I I truly think Texas whiskey is, is really blowing up and really becoming a entity all its own. I mean, and you know, light whiskey being a, a truly innovative piece of that. Like I, I I'm just blown away. I'm glad you took some time to sit with me today because honestly, I really want to keep sharing the story behind this, and hopefully, it keeps growing into something more. You know, I'm I'm hoping to well, see. Or more people are developing their own light whiskeys. And, and as, you know, you took the Texas grains, but, you know, you see Waterford Distillery and some other distilleries that are experimenting on things like terroir. I don't know what your stance on, is on it, you know, being a whiskey expert yourself, but, or a whiskey um, developer yourself. But I, I feel like there's probably something there scientifically, you know, with terroir, different regions, different dirt, different um, crop developments might actually have an impact on flavor. Um, so I'm curious to test it out. I I believe it. I mean, w the reason why we're all Texas grains is we live in Texas. I mean, it's local. There's less freight involved. We like to support the local agricultural community. We, you know, what the, the farmers, I mean, we, we essentially use a, a, the supply chain through Texmalt and, yeah. uh, we share supply chain with, uh, w with, um, uh, the still Austin people. Mm -hmm. And we like the fact that there's a relationship there with the guys that work the dirt. And um, anyway, we, we like that. And it's supporting local too. I mean, that's yeah, another thing I, I like to try and be big on. I mean, we all love having things at our fingertips, you know, Amazon, you know, some of the big companies that are, are convenience, but we do also like to support local, you know, some of the small Etsy businesses, Local business, Austin is the perfect market, you know, as, as I'm sure you know, having lived here longer than my wife and I probably have. I don't know. How long have you guys been in Austin? Have you, are you? The late, very late 90s. We, okay. Dell, Dell moved me here. But I, I seem like a whiskey guy, but I was really a computer guy before oh, cool. uh, I, I managed to become, uh, get, live the, uh, I think the way that it should be put is I'm, I'm living the dream. I was going to say, yeah, you're, you, you moved on to bigger and better things. <laughs> It's certainly fun, more fun. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Uh, so, so one of the things that I think is really cool about this, first of all, it really is, you know, light whiskey is a whole new category. It's underexplored. Secondly, this is like no other light whiskey. It's not only is it not like a bourbon, it's not like any other light whiskey. It is what it is. And I think one of the cool things about what you do is you can look at these niches. You can look at... Uh, Garrison Brothers, you can look at Austin 101, and you can look at Still Austin, and you can say, you could lay, I think you could line up 10 Kentucky whiskeys and include in that both Buffalo Trace and Blanton's. And then you could put a Garrison Brothers in there and an Austin 101. And all of the, the other eight other than the Austin 101 and, and the Garrison Brothers, would be very, very similar. And Garrison Brothers is, it has its own uniqueness. It's chewy. I mean, I use a knife, knife and a fork yeah. when I have a Garrison. I love it. And Austin 101 is like the opposite end of the spectrum. It's nothing like those bourbons. It's like oh. a completely different spirit. Yeah, I, I, we, we have a couple bottles of Garrison Brothers, and they're pricey, but they're worth the price. It's, you know, like you said, it's almost like a meal in a, in a Glencairn, you know, or a rocks glass. They, they're, they're heavy. They have the color, which isn't just, it's not food coloring. That is, it is That's a the big, real deal. The mouth feel bourbon. That bourbon is going to knock you on your ass if you have too much of it, but it is delicious. <laughs> they are experts at what they do. 
but I'm, I'm, that's not discounting the light whiskey. I mean, this has a mouthfeel all its own. Uh, it's unique. Um, and, you know, I don't want to discount the Kentucky bourbons because they have been doing it for a lot longer. They have been, they are experts of their craft. But you're right in saying that it, it's it's weird. You you can take 10, you know, uh, or a handful of, of Kentucky bourbons because there are a ton of them now. It's a really saturated market. You know, mm-hmm. craft beer, it's really saturated. There are similarities, a lot of similarities across the board. Um, and I mean, a lot of them are, are trying to do things to define themselves, but, you know, special releases, you know, labels, uh, really experimenting with the different flavor varietals and, and you know, terroir sourcings and things like that. But it is a little bit more of a, of a of, like I said, a saturated market. So, like, I'm really excited to see where Texas whiskey goes because, it's it's still developing you know um you're right stacking it against the kentucky bourbon even if it is the same style you know with the the grains being differently you know not the source from kentucky or from you know anywhere around that region um and also the way that they're developing the the bourbon um i also i don't know if you're familiar with andalusia whiskey you know the, yeah, the, yeah yeah i've been out there it, it's pretty cool the way they do it they rapidly you know, they rapidly um, age um, some of their whiskeys. They do an Irish and a Scotch style, a peated style. A, uh, I'm sorry, almost as ale, but a uh, whiskey um, that is, it, it's it's redefining kind of the regional style of whiskey. Um, I, I love that. Innovation. I'm just a big fan of innovation. <laughs> Whatever you can do to set yourself apart, which I mean is what smart business people do, but it's really cool because it just sets the bar a little bit higher for what you consider a traditional craft spirit. So, but one difference, so this is really innovative, right? So this is, it's light whiskey. And not only is it light whiskey, it's a very different light whiskey. That brings a challenge. The good news is if you taste it and you like it and you want some Austin 101, I don't have to worry about you looking at the shelf and seeing five alternatives. (laughs) Uh, Yeah. You're your own. Really, we're it. So that part's cool. If we win a customer, we got a customer. Uh, The negative is you walked, if you've never tasted it and you've never heard from someone like yourself that says, you know, gosh, this tastes is amazing. Um, You just, to to pick that off the shelf and decide to buy that instead of the the old comfort yeah uh it's it's a it's a challenge so it, our challenge now is largely you know we hit covid thing it's really hard to do live tastings we're going to get yeah. this in uh, on the lips of consumers and let them tell us and let the, let them decide whether this product is worth continuing and uh i hope they decide it is oh I couldn't agree more. You know, it's funny when I was searching for a bottle, I went to a couple specs because I I went to the wrong one initially um, because there's a bunch in Austin. And the guy looked at me a little weird when I said, you know, Austin 101 light whiskey. He's like, wait, light whiskey. What is it? Was it like light beer? You know, to me, you know, I I, I looked at it. I didn't even think about that. But from a branding perspective, you know, that that's a bit of a hurdle. Uh, so it's not like Bud Light, is it? <laughs> <laughs> the Bud Light of whiskey? No, it's not. It's not all. the Bud Light yeah, of whiskey. So it's honestly, it's more robust than a lot of whiskeys, ironically enough. Um, just because you're not used to that, the way that it sits on your tongue, um, it's really astounding. Uh, so, so I mean, how do you see yourself overcoming some of that? You know, in the future, from a branding perspective, from a, a, a yeah, the, the expensive answer to that is that we do a lot of face-to-face tastings. That's the expensive answer because it's really, you know, it costs me more to, to sell the bottle than it does to make the product, sadly, if it sure. means I have to have somebody taste it. The good news is when we do live tastings, it, about one in five people that taste it, I don't know that I'm supposed to say this, so you know, delete this later, but about one in five people that taste it go, whoa. I'm going to buy a bottle right now. So we have a very, very high conversion rate at live tastings that is kind of the envy, um, and which is cool, but it's still expensive. Live, live, live tastings. I mean, you got to hire somebody to stand there and oh, explain yeah. the product and do, and, you know, got to buy, buy a bottle off the shelf and pour it for people. Uh, so it's not a small investment. 
what we're hoping to do is to have some, when COVID, as COVID ends, uh, we think that it's, it will be more effective for us to reach out to people uh, with in larger gatherings, uh, to get it into bars and restaurants. Yeah, and have people taste it there. I mean, we it, it, it you know ultimately, if I get it in a bar and they pour and and the bartender likes it and he pours it for a dozen people, uh, that would have cost me a lot more money to have done that in a specs you know in a live tasting. That's true. Uh, than than to have the bartender pay me to buy a bottle, right? So well, anyway, you so, got, you're paying the specs person you know for the time, whereas the bartender, if he's got a bottle right there, you know the the time is limitless. It's just a matter of the cost of the bottle, which is right. A lot less than paying a person to sit there and, and try and do a targeted tasting at a liquor store where you don't know what the foot traffic is going to be like that time of day or that day itself. I know. It's very expensive. It's tough. This is going to be a tough market. But the, the, the good news is all the evidence is that if people like the product, which they do, they buy it again um, yeah, because it's pretty much alone on the shelf. It stands out visually, and it certainly stands out in a flavor profile. It does. I mean, it caught my eye for sure. I, I, oh man, I can't remember who it was that recommended to me. It was somebody that doesn't live in Austin, but they visited and they recommended, uh, check out Austin 101. And I'd never heard of it. I mean, it was middle of last year. So you guys were still just getting a foothold in the market. And I'm glad they did because honestly, I probably would have, it would have been a long time before I heard of, of who Austin 101 was. Uh, and I'm glad I did because this really opened my mind and my palate up quite a bit. Great. Sure. But you're right. I mean, you, I'm, I'm going to do my best Dan Garrison replic, you know, you know, impression from the video is, you know, the most important thing is you get this right here in front of the, the, the whiskey lovers, the, the consumer. And, you know, if they can't taste it, they can't appreciate it before they buy it, you know, it's, it's a lot harder, a lot harder sell more uphill, you know, especially something new. And I, I gotta say, you know, I'm, I'm a convert and I, I bought the bottle before I even tasted it, but I would say, yeah, it, it's, I'm curious to see in the next five years, maybe where light whiskey goes. I, I think I, I see a bright future for it. So we didn't even talk about how, I mean, we talked about how it pairs with, with uh, brew and we talked about how it sips. We didn't talk at all about how it makes cocktails and yeah. it's truly remarkable. I did not make this as a cocktail base. I made this to replace cognac on my right. whiskey shelf yeah, and to do it sipping. Yeah. Exactly. A you're, wonderful. You're targeting the purists, just like most, you know, Scotch, Irish and bourbon drinkers. They're, you know, they're not targeting the audience of cocktails. Or, or whatever, not. but but unlike cool. many scotches, which you wouldn't think in the world to make a cocktail out of, they're sipping only. You do if you oh. buy scotch and it's too peaty, which <laughs> you have many a time, sir. <laughs> well, but, this one uh, makes many, many better cocktails than you would imagine. I'm going to say, for example, it makes a Anything you would use a, a bourbon in, it makes a lighter, approachable, easy to drink, and surprisingly boozy um, alternative. It's really light and really, really, really fresh. It, uh, believe it or not, it, 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 anything you would use tequila or reposado in, like a right. uh, Rita, with lime, it goes really, really well with citrus. So where you would, it makes a far, far cleaner tasting cocktail than the than the funkiness of uh, tequila. Uh, and here's the shocker, and that my wife really pointed out to me: anything that you would use vodka in, at least that we've tried, uh, vodka has a little bit of a chemically clinical pharmaceutical. It has a little bit of a tiny little bit of bite to it in a cocktail. <laughs> this is like golden. It's just it adds a richness, yeah. and it doesn't have that uh, chemical pharmaceutical flavor that vodka tends to bring to a cocktail. In orange juice or in citrus or anything you would use a white rum or a vodka in, 
this makes a just a richer golden alternative. It's really pretty cool I cocktail. Imagine, based on your terminology earlier in the video, um, that that roundness comes into play. You know, it really adds more robust flavor as opposed to a white spirit, you know, like a vodka or like a uh, tequila is not a white spirit, but you know, a lighter spirit um, mm -hmm. like or yeah. white rum. Yeah, or, or, yeah. Or white rum, for example. Yeah, um, it just adds a little bit more complexity, you know. And I'm curious, have you tried it in a? In a uh, you talked about a mule, you know. A mule for me is is a fantastic. Um, I, a Moscow mule is just the conventional version, but I do love a good whiskey mule. But I'm curious, have you tried it in old fashioned? You know, more. Yeah, oh whiskey? yes, we call it a new fashioned. But it makes a wonderful drink in an old fashioned. It makes a, you can make a number of wonderful Manhattans out of it, depending on what the spirit is that you marry it with. There's some really cool Italian versus a, a sweet cocktail. Yeah. Yep. Uh, it goes really well with cherry. So Luxardo cherries and this are they're meant to live together. I mean, if it, 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 to, uh, this is, <clears throat> I think we call this the ice teeny. You, you shake Austin 101 with a couple of bar spoons of Luxardo juice. Mm -hmm. I, I know. You, so you've got some roots over there. You, maybe you have a Luxardo at home, <clears throat> but you shake, Ew. you shake a couple of bar spoons of, of uh, Luxardo cherry juice with Austin 101 in ice and you strain it over a Luxardo cherry. You have got a martini <clears throat> alternative that uh, I mean, it's m a little bit more like a Manhattan than a martini, I guess, but it, it's really very, very light in flavor profile. It's Austin 101, very ice chilled, smooth and round and silky with that little bit of Luxardo uh, cherry flavor. Oh, it, it, you could hurt yourself with those. I was going to say, I wish I, I kind of want to go get the equipment to do that because we have those, the dark cherry, the Luxardo cherry um uh, a can of it or a jar of it and i have the equipment for it i'm finding the urge right now to go over and do it because i still got some guinness left <laughs> yeah i know it's a, it's not exactly the same as drinking it with guinness but <laughs> it, 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 this is a very very versatile number so and exciting sounding mark alternative to a martini for somebody who's not big on the vodka flavor who was a whiskey drinker but looking for an alternative cocktail i like that that's a really interesting concept yeah, it's real. It's very, very good. I we call it the ice teeny, but I mean, I imagine it pairs really well with orange as well. You know, that very like old fashioned. Yeah, exceptionally well with orange. It goes um, uh, really well with uh, Cointreau mm. as a source of the orange flavor. So with lime, Cointreau, and this, we we have a, a cocktail recipe called the ran our ranch water, which essentially is a margarita with with soda in it. W oh, yeah. Only instead of te tequila, it's we use Cointreau, uh, Austin 101, and uh, Topo Chico, or 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 the spirit, the uh, sparkling water of your choice. Beautiful. Um, and and with the lime, and it, it it makes a nice. I think in the summertime, it's going to be a real go-to drink for us. There's another one that we do that's a little harder to source, which is called we called it the the Austin 101 Tea Time. And we actually put this together to try to do a tasting for the Dell match play a year ago. And we were going to be at a local liquor store. And this, uh, it, it tastes like a, you know, they, they make this drink that's a 50% lemonade and 50% iced tea. It's sort of like sweet lemony Arnold tea. <laughs> hmm? Arnold Palmer. Arnold Palmer. <laughs> and it tastes like that. It's, it's lemon and tea. It's a it's a vanilla Earl Grey syrup that we use, which is spectacular. Uh, it's so easy to drink. And um, make that? the vanilla Earl Grey syrup, you said. It's a, we use a vanilla Earl Grey syrup, which is available on Amazon. It's uh, right. called Pratt Standard um, uh, Earl Grey syrup, or uh, and uh, it's on. It's on Amazon. It is. It's really, really wonderful. It makes a a, a drink that tastes like lemony iced tea. Uh, that is with the Austin One Hundred and One. It's just delicious. That sounds fantastic. 
So anyway, it's more versatile than just a sipping lit whiskey. And when I, when we first started making cocktails, it's like it wrenched my heart because I want to drink it the way that I had made it, the way I'd created it. You want the and, pure form. But, I, what is this number four? I don't know how many, but I am, I am appreciating this whiskey right now <laughs> at a very high level. <laughs> But so, so what else do you have? I mean, what other cocktails have you encountered um, or ways of enjoying the Austin 101 whiskey? Can you think um, of? Well, I mentioned the mules. My wife happens sure. to, she was just, uh, has made a, a commitment to lose a little bit of weight. And um, yeah, I shouldn't be telling this to all of your viewers, but she has, dis she has discovered that a, uh, that this makes a great mule, even with diet ginger ale. So a squirt of lemon, diet ginger ale, there's no sugar at all. There is nothing added to this. There's no sugar in this. The only carbohydrate in it is ethanol. And I can tell you, there've been scientific studies that show that ethanol is not fattening. <laughs> it is a carbohydrate, but it, and I'm, you know. I, I, it's much better than beer and wine. It is. It's a it, ethanol itself, although it counts as a, as a as calories, and it is a carbohydrate. There was a study done, I think it was in the 1980s, and they took a bunch of people, and they had a controlled diet, and they added half of them. Added a thousand calories a day of chocolate, which is a lot of calories, and it's a lot of chocolate, and yeah. half of them had a thousand calories a day, which is a lot of whiskey. Yeah, but no, no, no uh, syrup, no sugar, nothing, just whiskey. Great whiskey. Ooh. Just, well, water, but no juice, That's no sugar, no carbon. That's control group right there. That's your control group. That was the yeah. one you volunteered. You know, it couldn't quite have been uh, a, a double blind because I would think I would know the difference between chocolate and whiskey. What? So it wasn't a clinical trial, but it was, they measured their weights over time. And the people that added a thousand calories a day of chocolate to their normal diet gained, I don't remember the number, say 10 pounds in a month. Maybe it was 15. They, they gained a lot of weight. It was very measurable. The people that took the whiskey actually lost weight. They didn't gain weight. They lost weight on top of their normal. So the, the theory behind that is that your body has to work to detoxify and to expel the alcohol. It doesn't get turned into glycogen stored in your muscles yeah. as, uh, as starches. It's, it's processed very, very differently. It's processed by your liver, right. not by the cells of your body as an, a source of energy. You heard it here. Drink whiskey to lose weight. That's drink. That's the, that is the theory. This you know, I'm, now the FDA has not approved that statement. Um, and drink responsibly. I drink responsibly. You to say that on all my posts and my videos. <laughs> exactly. This is made responsibly and carefully. Please enjoy it. The same. Time, money and blood, sweat and tears were put into this whiskey. Not literally, but. And Slanchava, by the way, right? We're almost on to the day. Prost, slancha, cheers, whatever Slanchev. you believe in, in whatever wherever country you're following from, but drink. Mm. Anthony, I, I feel like I've converted an, a, a new Austin 101 aficionado. I'm pretty excited about it. I'm really, really happy for your comments and your, your audience. Aficionado is a very loose term in this case, but I will say I am definitely an enthusiast and I appreciate it. I'll take enthusiast. And you know more about Austin 101 than 99.999% of, of America. So you, know, you are in the few. I'm going to look back to this video and appreciate it when Austin 101 becomes the new, you know, it whiskey. I hope you're right. I do too. It's, it's a fantastic whiskey. Whiskey. Ooh, we're getting there. And uh, and honestly, I really appreciate the time that you spent with me, Tom. Uh, I love learning about it. And it is, I mean, it's it's so different. Uh, I'm glad to have it on my bar, you know? Fantastic. Well, 
uh, be sure when it's empty that you buy another one of these because you oh, won't find anything quite like it on the shelf. Did I miss any of your uh, uh, listeners? There weren't too many major questions, uh, just you know, to deal with cocktails, supporting mm -hmm. local. Um, I think we hit the cocktails pretty hard. We <laughs> did. We did. Uh, I'm excited to, to experiment with those after the fact. Um, yeah, and, and I'm looking forward to what you guys are developing. You know, we'll see. First, we have to make this thing about. successful, but uh, that's the focus. We'll but yeah, uh, I will be reaching out to you potentially outside of this about that O to V. I, I'm curious to try it. To be oh, honest, oh okay. Well, that's yeah, that will definitely be possible, Anthony. We can make that yeah. happen. And then potentially, we'll see. I don't know about that rye um, down the road, but but yeah. Again, thank you so much for your time. I thank really you. And we're looking to see what Austin Craft Spirits and Austin 101 develops into. Thank you so much, Anthony. Really appreciate the opportunity to talk to your audience. Yeah. Tom, cheers. And keep pouring, my friend. Thank you. Slancha.